Hi, it's Terry Dennery of The Math Works. So in this video, uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun, all right? And uh, I've been very tempted to call this video playing pinball just like Ben Heck, all right? And so there's a little bit of a story behind this. And um, and if you don't know who Ben Heck is, uh, he's a very uh, funny, interesting, but very smart and very skilled uh, engineer who's been creating a lot of videos on various uh, projects that he's done with electronics all right and so he's got this great skill set skill set for electronics where um, you know he's defining circuits and building boards and and doing interesting things like making a replica of the Apple one all by himself so um, yeah so so anyways uh, I met Ben recently and um, you know, and he's got real passion for pinball, and he's been working on a project to basically build a pinball machine. And we realized that, hey, this might be an area where we can work together on a few things. So, any, anyways, um, I hesitate to call this video playing pinball like Ben Heck, because as you can see, uh, well, I, I, I don't play pin that, pinball that well, and I think uh, I think Ben does it, plays it quite better, you know, uh, much better than I do. So. Um, so anyways, with regard to this video, there are a couple of, I think, really interesting things that really, again, kind of, um, you know, demonstrate and show what a great tool MATLAB and Simulink is for really kind of customization. So what we were just looking at, it was all done within MATLAB and Simulink, and it, it uh, heartily, well, it uses quite strongly uh, the, the capabilities of Simscape multi-body. Okay, but the things that we were also doing were that we were making use of a game controller. And then uh, obviously we were modeling the contact between that ball and the various surfaces uh, contained within the pinball machine. And uh, most namely the moving ones that are, you know, part of the paddles that are there to hit the ball, which are also driven by my interaction with the game controller. Okay, so this is the Simulink model that uh, basically has captured the whole design of what we've just been working with. It includes our connection to a game controller and then it includes essentially a Simscape multi-body model very similar to the stuff we've done in previous videos uh, that represent essentially the mechanics of the system. So we just hit the run button right there and it will launch the mechanical explorer for Simscape and we'll see it will initialize the ball over there on the left and it starts moving and I start with my game controller I can start kicking it around. Oh, I'm doing pretty good now. Okay, that's one of my better ones. All right, and, and so anyways, I want to just talk a little bit about what we have here. Uh, the game control, and, and really what I want to focus on is the game controller itself and how we model that contact. And so if we look at the game controller part, it begins with this block, and it's called a joystick input. All right, and this is something that ships with our tool called Simulink 3D Animation. We see the block right there. Oops, I left that in there from before. So, but basically the idea is you just drag that in, and we're operating off of something that's called the buttons. All right, so this knows that it's connected to a game controller. My game controller is not a joystick, but the joystick is a little bit of a misnomer uh, in that it's a general interface for connecting with these types of devices. Right. Right. Now my game controller actually has like buttons here, here, one, two, three, four, uh, here, here, and then here, here. So there are about ten, 10 buttons, and it turns out that five and six are the key ones. That will be that button, and then this button. And so by making that choice here, we're accessing you know just the inputs from that one, and that these essentially are now generating signals that we then operate on. You know, one controls the left paddle and the other one controls the right paddle. Right? And I double click on this. We'll see, you know, a number of things are taking place here. Right? And so here is essentially a trigger. Right? right? And I'll explain what that is in a second. That operates, I think this may be either the closing, well, see, it's one or the other. It's, it's moving the, um, the paddle from its initial position minus 50 degrees. So we go from zero right there to minus 50. And then the other one here is triggered in an, in an opposite sense and it moves that same paddle, in this case from its current position of zero to, 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 to something that gets added to of 50. 
All right? And I believe as we get into this, we'll see that one has a upward moving trigger. And that, all that's really saying is that I'm going from a negative value on this signal to a positive value. So I'm passing zero and I'm passing it in a negative to positive direction. All right? And then this one, I think, is probably the opposite. You can see the arrow pointing down right there. So it's going from positive to a, a, a negative number and it's passing zero on what they call a, what do they call this? I think uh, a falling edge, right, where the other one's a rising edge. The main point is that it's kind of simple what this is, at least conceptually, and it's simply taking a signal and output, and essentially this function only gets captured, um, you know, when we get triggered like this, and so by sending a clock, we're essentially capturing that start time. Right, and so then that start time essentially sets things in motion. So there it is, right there, for the calculation, of the transition, which we saw parameterized to be from zero to fifty on one case and minus fifty or zero to minus fifty on the other. Right, and since these two get added up, you know, you can kind of see how a complete motion will be kind of captured you know, where you, you rise to 50 and then you go back to zero by simply adding these two signals. All right, so anyways, it's kind of the, the, the powerful combination of being able to connect to hardware, which we can because we have a block like this, but then being able to do something with it because you got a lot of interesting capability through the functionality of Simulink. All right, now I didn't go into exhaustive detail of everything I did here, but we are putting all these files up on MATLAB Central, it means that, you know, completely free of charge, you're able to go to that website and download anything we're doing. And so if you do have interest in this, uh, please go to MATLAB Central, get the files, and certainly I'd welcome you to send me emails if you got specific questions. All right. So let's get a little bit into the contact modeling. All right. And so most of what we're looking at here, well, certainly all of what we're looking at here is essentially the mechanical model. And as we've shown in previous videos, like I think video two and video five, um, you know how we are able to go from CAD to mechanical model very rapidly. And certainly that is the case with this one too. And uh, I'd say, again, we kind of hit those objectives of about probably 15 minutes the model was built, right? Now, in this one, we had to do something kind of interesting, and that's what all these little blocks here are, which are all about capturing contact, right? And I want to just kind of zoom in a little bit on what we did here, all right? So let me go up, all right? And we came up initially with a very simple contact model, all right? And I want to show the basics of it, and we might get a little bit more into how this is done, but the, the basics are right here, all right? That there is a signal that's essentially generated as a position measurement on what we'll call the Z variable. In a moment we'll kind of take a look at the, the 3D image of this and un understand that Z is a measurement of position that is perpendicular to the surface in which we're, you know, potentially going to have contact. All right, and, and so this positional measurement feeds essentially a spring type of force law, all right? And so based on positional displacement, uh, we're able to calculate what the spring force will be, right? Now, in the case of contact, it's actually a pretty good model, but but it's very, um, I'll call it this, that it's very one-sided. It's very unilateral, okay? And what it means is that if there is no contact between ball and wall, well, it means that there's no force at all. And if there is contact between wall, ball and wall, and in we'll kind of work with this idea of pen penetration of the ball into the wall, it's going to apply a force that's going to be proportional to that penetration, all right? And then we use real big numbers like this so that we essentially get something that's very re um, representative of, of, of the type of contact that we're seeing in this, which is it's a very stiff contact, all right? So very little penetration, but again, as we penetrate, that's essentially you know where the the energy and power is coming from to repulse the ball and have it move um, in the, the exact opposite direction that it, that it approached the ball with, right? And then because no collision is really perfect, where you completely conserve energy, we need a little bit more than simply just spring constant. We have damping also, right? And the role of damping is essentially, you know, a role where it dissipates energy, and basically it means that whatever direction the ball is moving in it's going to apply a force opposite, 
right? In this case, it's going to also apply a force that's proportional to the speed at which it's moving. And that's a very classic definition of damping, all right? Okay, so I'm bringing it to our 3D modeling environment to emphasize two important points, all right? And so you'll see our ball right there, all right? And if I go to the list here, I'll see the ball has a, a constraint called planar, and that that planar constraint is really defined by these two green lines right here, which really mark out uh, the plane in which that ball will be available for movement, right? And so if I go to my front view and I look at it in wireframe, I think it's pretty clear to see that the plane is parallel to the surface of the ball, and it's really this constraint that really imposes that it's it's going to always stay in contact with the, the surface of the pinball machine. Okay. All right. Now the reason that's so important, at least for what we our goals were, was that it makes our contact modeling much, much simpler. And one way to think of this is it's much easier to think about what's the distance between a circle and a line than it is to think about what's the difference the, the distance between a sphere and a surface. Okay, so I hope that's helpful, but, but, but clearly uh, it offered an, a simplicity which we saw in our contact model that we we're just looking at, which is that a single parameter, which happened to be a measurement of z, uh, was used to not only identify whether or not the ball was in contact with the surface, but also to identify the force that will be imposed on the ball when contact does occur. All right, now the other thing that makes that possible is the idea of a local measurement, all right? And so we, you know, we always make measurements in three dimensions on position relative to coordinate frames, all right? And so I'm going to put a coordinate frame on that surface, coordinate frame on this surface. Right, so let's zoom in here. And it's clear those are oriented differently, but let's just kind of make sure that's clear too. Um, Let's rotate it like that. I think it's pretty clear the Z is pointing out perpendicular to the surface and that the, the tool's designed so that whenever you put frames in place that it does make that choice. Z is always perpendicular. So when we bring this over from SimWise into Simulink, um, you know, it'll look like this. You know, and so every one of those those frames that were on a surface but were not participating in joints, they simply show up as an available port connection. So left wall contact is a frame that's represented by where my mouse is here. All right, and so the idea of implementing this reusable contact model, which is always you know kind of based on a local measurement of z relative to a frame like this, you know, it's really pretty easy to implement. Right, that we just connect. The frames like that, and it's, our, you know, at this point we've identified the wall that the ball needs to contact, that we need to account for that, and so then the other connection is into the ball itself, right? And so, connecting into this green line that represents what we call CS1 on the ball, and my familiarity with the way this model was built is that I know that to be the center of mass. All right, and that we did put together a contact model that kind of accounts for the radius of the ball. Okay, so anyways, you know, maybe the bigger point on this, you know, and, and I think that these were two really good examples to just kind of really get out there and, um, and discuss, you know, is that, that the, the customization of MATLAB and Simulink is an extremely important part of this, right? And so I want to kind of explain this a little bit. Right. And so my job, you know, working for MathWorks as an application engineer is to meet with many, many uh, engineering teams uh, a year from many, many companies, probably in excess of 100. OK. And uh, these people are doing this really, you know, challenging and very, you know, fulfilling and very interesting work of kind of making software and hardware work together. And, 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 and certainly, um, you know, MATLAB and Simulink are very good tools to develop such systems. OK. And, and so there's a lot that they have writing on it, and they always ask me some pretty challenging questions. You know, and the questions will be, you know, maybe if I'm doing a pinball machine, can I model contact? You know, can I communicate with this? Right? And it can be all kinds of things that, that, that are asked about. Okay? And the nice thing about supporting a tool like MATLAB and Simulink is that the answer is always yes. 
you know, as long as that can be represented by a mathematical solution, particularly solutions that are, are direct in, in, in solving things like, you know, ordinary differential equations with all kinds of interesting algebraic constraints, we know that it can be done. Okay. And, um, and I think that, you know, a caveat is that it may not be off the shelf. Okay. And, um, I, th I think I've become very okay with that, and I think it, it, it's helped me understand how engineering teams really do need to work. You know, the, that a vendor like, like us at MathWorks, who really are good at building, you know, dynamic system models and solving out, you know, very, I'll call it complex algebraic, um, you know, you know, problems with the tools of Simulink and MATLAB, you know, that we're, you know, I think, you know, very arguably, uh, you know, we're the best in the world at that. Okay, but we're not the best of the world at what you do, you know, and the very specific nature of what you do and the subtlety and the nuances of what you need to do, you know, only you know how to do that. Okay, and, and therefore, it really is left best, or it's best left in your hands to really kind of address those kinds of, you know, unique features that you're going to need to do what you're going to need to do. You know, again, like contact modeling or communicating with a device like this. So anyways, that's the basic point of what we wanted to say in this video is that certainly, yes, there's a way to do contact modeling that you can model a, 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 a pinball machine quite well. But even more important is that you can customize your models to capture those, those very important features that are going to be absolutely necessary for you to achieve what you're going to need to achieve via simulation. Thank you very much for watching this video. Um, we very much encourage you to submit questions. Even though we're not a bunch of gurus at handling social media, we will answer these questions eventually. So please excuse us if we're a little bit late at times. But um, we love the questions. Uh, please submit them through the YouTube comments. Or you know, even feel free to contact me directly via email. Um, if you like the video, uh, please give us a thumbs up. That's very helpful to us, and we appreciate it very much. Thank you.